that's the sound of me consuming a donut. And yeah, I know it's bad for me. All the sugar, the fat, and so forth, it's probably going to add, you know, a, a millimeter to my waist within the hour. But, you know, one thing I never thought it would do, and that is modify my DNA. Although I have to say, even if it does, I'm going to finish this donut. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we give you the wide-angle view on science and technology. Heredity was once understood to be straightforward. Genes were passed from parents to offspring, and you were blessed or stuck with the lot you got. DNA did not change over a lifetime. Well, now we know that isn't true. Your environmental exposures and lifestyle influence the chemical switches that govern your DNA's behavior. Moreover, powerful gene editing tools let us tinker with genes directly, editing them or adding new ones. And there may be evidence in both cases that one generation's genetic alterations can be inherited by the next. In this episode, the science of epigenetics, NASA's astronaut twin study, editing the mosquito genomes to prevent malaria, and how all of this challenges our traditional concept of heredity. It's DNA is not destiny. We have two stories, each from an unusual laboratory where experiments in genetic modification are testing our old notion that DNA is destiny. The second will come later in the show, but we can tell you that both labs share something in common. They are secured with airlocks. The first airlock is necessary because there is no air in space. Well, the airlock is the door to the International Space Station that allows you to go outside into space and hopefully back inside because if you couldn't make it back inside it'd be really bad hi this is scott kelly i'm a former nasa astronaut and u.s navy fighter pilot and test pilot captain kelly was on the international space station for about a year during which time something funny happened to his dna and we know that because scientists compared scott's dna with that of his identical twin brother mark on earth the results of this NASA twin study reveal the workings of epigenetics. Hello, I'm Christopher Mason at Weill Corner Medicine, an associate professor of genetics and computational biology. Dr. Mason and other researchers involved in this unique study were looking to see how the body and the genome respond to living in space. So here's the setup. While Mark Kelly, Scott Kelly's twin brother and an astronaut too, by the way, stayed home, Captain Kelly went up on the ISS, the International Space Station, for a year. You know, as an astronaut, your job is to not only fly the vehicle and, you know, operate the hardware and perform the mission, but it's also to be a, uh, you know, experimental subject, I think. Researchers ran a suite of tests on the twins before and after Captain Kelly's year in space. And so we did all kinds of sequencing on, on various levels within the cell, so DNA, RNA, proteins, really small molecules in the cells. We looked at large-scale changes, like in what happened in the vasculature, look at what happens in the veins and arteries. Also, his cognition was measured by uh, some other researchers, was looking at what happens for his how reaction time and how quickly can he solve puzzles. It required me to take a lot of, uh, you know, samples of, uh, you know, bodily fluids, and it, it required me to do a lot of cognitive tests. It required me to do a lot of imaging on, uh, you know, certain parts of my body with ultrasound. While you were on board the space station. Yeah, absolutely. The researchers wondered if they'd see epigenetic changes in Scott Kelly's DNA when he returned. Epigenetics is the idea that DNA is not fixed, but can change due to environmental factors. We're going to hear the results of the study. But first, let's consider this startling idea of epigenetics from the gene's point of view. Say you're a gene. You're a short section of the double helix DNA molecule tightly bundled into a chromosome all in the nucleus of a cell. 
It's not the nucleus of a newly fertilized egg, so you can relax, knowing that any changes to you that might happen have already happened back during chromosome reshuffling when a new organism got its start. You successfully made it into a new host, and now your one and only job as a gene is to express yourself. Turn on and produce some proteins or stay mute and don't. It's straightforward. Except that we now know that there are other chemical players involved with this simple scenario. As a gene, you may have noticed that you and the rest of the DNA is not floating around alone and naked in that cell. You're surrounded by and attended to a bunch of other molecules. They're mostly proteins, some called histones, that are the spools around which the DNA double helix wraps. Don't worry, these chemicals don't mess with you directly. As a gene, you stay intact but they do determine how and when and if you do your gene thing. This is known as epigenetics. Reporter Carl Zimmer. And it's an incredibly important area because to understand how our cells work, it's not enough just to have a catalog of genes. You actually have to see those genes in their three-dimensional reality as they're being controlled and responding to the environment. So you're a gene, but your gene behavior is tied to the behavior of epigenetic chemicals, and their behavior is tied to whatever your host organism experiences. What kind of food is it eating? Is it breathing clean air? Under stress at work? Is it living in an artificial habitat about 250 miles up in low Earth orbit? Astronaut Scott Kelly spent a year on the ISS. Now, let's find out how his DNA compared to that of his brother Mark once he returned home. Okay, Chris, so the idea was you tested these guys both before and after Scott Kelly's space flight. So you expected that Scott, who spent uh, all this time in space, that his gene expression, the activity of the genes, would be different than his brothers here on the ground. I mean, that per se isn't so much a surprise, is it? That's right, yeah. So really, any point of any day when you're moving through the environment, when you eat spicy food, you know, when you have a big gulp of soda, your gene expression, how which genes get turned on and turned off, will change and does change. Basically, it's a response to what, what you're doing, what you're eating, and what you're encountering in the world. And that is also part of epigenetics is controlling uh, what genes get turned on and turned off and what's called RNA. And so that's what we'd reported is that actually there were some genes that got turned on when he was in space, uh, actually thousands of them. And then when he came back to Earth, it turns out after six months, they were still uh, activated as if they were still in space. And so we called these genes what seem to be almost perturbed genes from space flight that we want to keep an eye on because we don't know when or if they'll return back to sort of a baseline state. Now, what do you think caused this change in these genes? I mean, was it, I don't know, the hard radiation in space or the you know lower levels of oxygen or, I don't know, maybe even weightlessness has something to do with it? Yeah, so one exciting thing about gene expression is that the molecules themselves of RNA can tell you uh, what genes they came from and then so what genes those are that are responding. So we saw genes activated for everything from bone repair to DNA repair and bone formation and also immune, immunological stress. We saw all these genes changing, all of which seemed to, would, are the genes you would expect to see changing when you are, are really in zero gravity and weightless and also being you know, slightly higher uh, irradiated when you're up in the space station. Well, lay it on me. What sort of changes did you see? I mean, what were they related to in terms of, I don't know, metabolism or behavior or, or ability? Yeah, so we, we did see, uh, you know, all those genes. So when you have basically DNA damage, these are the genes that come activated. So some genes uh, like P53 or DNA repair enzymes that have to come in and fix broken DNA. We saw those get enriched. Uh, but one of the biggest signatures was just the immune system response, which you saw in his bloodstream, large amounts of uh, other fragments of DNA that are really activated when you have an infection almost. It looks as if the immune system was at high alert. Partly we think because, it, you know, the immune system doesn't know what this is. It's suddenly you're in zero gravity and it views it as just an immune stress and responds accordingly. That's kind of how the body responds to the, you know, the changes of fluids in the body, the microgravity, and also a little bit of the radiation. So his body was on alert. Yes, yeah, for really a high alert. And, uh, you know, also he did lose some weight during the study. He lost 7% of his weight in that year in space. So, you know, there was a little bit of weight loss that uh, also might be contributing. But, but overall, it seems like a really consistent signature was this immune reaction to being in space. Now, would you say that it's 
peculiar to being in space. I mean, suppose Scott hadn't gone into space, but he had done the Tour de France or something like that. I mean, right. you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have changes occurred then, too? So we're looking at that right now. We actually just got samples from another p pair of twins who um, one stayed on a ground and one climbed Mount Everest. And we're just getting those samples into the lab actually this week. So we started to, we started to look at that question of how often do these kinds of changes occur during other kinds of stress? Because we didn't see them in Mark, who was on Earth, but we did see them in Scott. And, you know, we do see the, what the genes look like that, you know, again, they're DNA repair genes, immune stress, bone formation genes. But but we want to see how often we see them uh, on terrestrial stress as well. And uh, that work has just started. Now, one thing that apparently changed was the length of his telomeres. And these are the caps at the end of chromosomes, kind of like that little bit of plastic that you find at the end of a shoelace. And they have a role in determining the rate of aging. What had happened to Scott's telomeres? Yeah, so this is a very exciting part of the study because it was really the opposite of what we expected. So telomeres normally get shorter as you age, as, as you just mentioned. They're an indicator of your overall sort of uh, lifespan. And actually, they got longer in space. We actually were so confused. This came from work in Susan Bailey's lab. She sent me additional samples. We replicated it in my lab. We sent her some of our samples. We confirmed it in two different labs and really made sure it was real. And then also uh, in Dr. Bailey's lab, they did additional astronaut samples. So we think this seems to be really a surprising feature of space flight for not just Scott, but maybe for other astronauts as well, that this is strangely how the body responds to being in flight. And then as soon as you get back to Earth, it goes away. Oh, that's too bad, uh, because uh, it sounds like he's not going to live to be 200 uh, because no, he's not here in the yet. space station. <laughs> if he had stayed up there, I mean, does this does this suggest he would have lived longer than your average lifespan? <laughs> It seemed, at least on the on the the rates that we saw, it, you know, it, it wasn't as if they got five times longer. They were in the range of 15 to 20 percent longer, which is still, you know, significant and something again the opposite direction that it normally occurs. And uh, you know, it just means that he would be, you know, slightly, he could potentially live a little bit longer. But really, you know, it's a big speculation. We we have no idea what the long term impact would be. We'd have to study him and many other copies of, of uh, twins uh, for, you know, really decades to really understand that. But but it is very, it was one of the some more surprising parts of the study and something certainly worth keeping an eye on uh, for future missions. Now, Chris, some reports circulated that there were substantial changes to Scott's DNA after his year in space to the extent of being 7%. 7% of it was altered. That's a lot in a genome, I would think. Uh, can you set the record straight on that? Because that that number, I think, is somewhat misleading. Yes. So what we had uh, talked about is that 7% of the genes that had changed expression actually did not yet return back to normal. And so uh, unfortunately, a couple of media outlets picked it up and just said 7% of his genes were lost, as if 7% of his DNA had changed. And keeping in mind that between us and chimps, it's really just, uh, you know, 1% and other species, just a handful of percent. So if he lost 7% of his genes or DNA, he'd be a different species, right? So um, some of those reports were definitely wrong. And the, to set the record straight, it became a great teachable moment of what is the difference between a gene being present or being expressed. And so obviously the expression of the gene is like the, when you read the book of life as one of sort of the active form of your genetic code versus just losing a whole page from your book of life, which is what kind of some of the headlines looked like for a little while. The really exciting thing, though, is that we now have a short list of genes to keep an eye on for future astronauts that seem to change when you're up there and, and don't go back right away. You know, if he had come back a different species, if if he went up a man and, and, and came back a turtle, I mean, that would have been, you know, dismaying for his wife, I would I would think. Yes. Yeah, he would. You know, I think we'd get less applicants to the astronaut program if that happened. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah. Christopher Mason, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Great. Thank you. My pleasure. Christopher Mason is an associate professor of genetics and computational biology at Weill Cornell Medicine. And now a decidedly earthbound astronaut's reaction to being a lab rat in space. Scott, it sounds like uh, you're in some sort of conveyance. Are you in a car somewhere? I'm in a spaceship going to Mars. <laughs> no, actually, I'm in a, uh, I think it's a suburban heading to Sea Island, Georgia. I wish I was in a spaceship. <laughs> now, when you came back to Earth and you heard about these epigenetic changes. What was your reaction to hearing about that stuff? Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, it's it's something that, uh, you know, is not symptomatic. I can't feel it. It's, I think, interesting information for me. And, and what about the telomeres? Because unlike what normally happens, yeah, uh, you know, as you get older, your telomeres yeah. shorten. You know, did you did you notice that at least? Did you say, wow, I feel 20 years younger or something? 
No. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, my telomeres apparently in space got uh, better. But, you know, within a f- couple of months, I think, after I got home, they were back to where they were pre-flight. So not the fountain of youth. <laughs> well, that's disappointing. Well, finally then, Scott, you know, you come back to Earth, and at least for a while, some of your DNA has been altered. Did you feel like you didn't have an identical twin during that period? I hoped so, but uh, <laughs> when I see him in person, he looks somewhat similar to me, so I guess not. <laughs> well, Scott, thanks very much. All right, take care. Captain Scott Kelly is a former military test pilot and an astronaut. What fascinates you about this study? Well, I think it's interesting to me simply because of the immediate applicability to the human exploration of the solar system. I mean, you know, we we, we go to Mars, we go to, to the moons of Jupiter, we go all over the solar system every night on my TV. But one of the big unknowns is how good an idea is that? Is that going to affect the health of the uh, crew members in ways that we haven't yet learned about? So, you know, this this study bears on that. What TV show are you watching that travels all over the solar system? Just about any sci-fi show on the air. And there always are plenty of them. Well, it's wild stuff, but as we heard, the changes to astronaut Scott Kelly's DNA were mostly reversed after he spent time on Earth. But what if they stuck around? The story gets even weirder with the suggestion that epigenetic changes can be inherited. In other words, the consequences of behavior could be passed down to the next generation. It's DNA is not destiny on Big Picture Science. If you like to be liked, you'll like Native. It's a safe, simple, and effective deodorant that has over 7,000 five-star reviews in places like Women's Health, Good Morning America, Nylon, and, well, a lot more. Look, you've been locked into the same factory-formulated deodorant ever since you were a teenager. But Native has ingredients that don't sound like an organic chemistry pop quiz. You'll also be pleased to note that it's not tested on animals and is aluminum-free. You can get Native in coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, eucalyptus and mint, or, if you're fragrance agnostic, unscented. And here's a special deal for listeners. 20% off your first purchase if you go to nativedeodorant.com and use promo code BPS, as in big picture science. 20% off. Just mouse over to nativedeodorant.com and use promo code BPS. Native deodorant, effective and simply better. The results of the NASA twin study aren't only relevant to astronauts. They're yet more evidence that everyone's DNA is subject to sometimes dramatic modification by our environment. Scott Kelly's DNA reverted to his pre-flight chemistry when he returned to Earth, and it's our understanding that epigenetic changes accumulated over a lifetime are erased before genes are passed to a new generation. But we aren't certain of that. Research on non-human species suggests that at least some of the changes can be passed down. Reporter Carl Zimmer, whose latest book is on the science of heredity, describes those studies and what the NASA twin study says and doesn't say about changes to astronaut Scott Kelly's DNA. Yeah, so what is happening in a study like that is that the actual sequence of letters in Scott's genes is not being rewritten by being in space. But when scientists look at his cells before and after and compare them to his brother Mark's, they can see that there are epigenetic differences. They can see that the pattern of molecules around his DNA seems to be different in some regards than it was before. Now, in some cases, and and maybe it would be in the case of Scott's, if some genes are turned on and they're turned off due to environmental factors, could those changes in those genes or the activation or the dormant state of those genes be passed on to another generation? Ah, well, that is a very big controversy. 
Um, so uh, this is something called uh, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Nice big phrase. And so the idea there is that an experience that a person or some other species has alters the epigenetics in their cells. That includes germ cells, in other words, eggs and sperm, that, that can then produce the next generation. And that next generation, the idea goes, can inherit those epigenetic changes along with the genes. And so there are lots of really good, compelling examples in nature that this can indeed happen. Uh, they just don't really include humans. <laughs> can you give us an example, though, of how it might happen? Sure. So let's say there's a plant and minding its own business, and it gets attacked by some insects. So plants switch on a bunch of genes when they sense this sort of attack, and they produce a bunch of chemicals that the hope is, quote-unquote, to drive off the insects, or at least sort of minimize their attack. Plants that experience an attack from insects or, or pathogens, they will produce seeds, and if the, when those seeds grow into new plants, they will actually respond faster to these kinds of attacks than they would have otherwise. Like they have a memory. Yeah. And the same is true of the seeds that you produce from those plants. Um, and so you, it seems to go through several generations with plants. Well, here's a blue sky question. You ready? Actually, it's higher than blue sky because <laughs> it's at the the orbit of the International Space Station. Let's say that Scott had fathered a child in space when he was his molecules were undergoing these changes. Is it possible that anything that had changed in his, we say his DNA did not change, but any of these epigenetic factors could have been passed down to his child? There's no evidence from humans that it could have. And part of that reason for that is that it seems that plant biology and animal biology are very different. And the way that epigenetics is controlled in both kinds of organisms is different. And so in humans, during the process of an embryo developing and producing its own eggs or sperm, a lot of those epigenetic marks that may have accumulated in one's lifetime gets stripped away in those cells. And then a sort of a baseline set of epigenetic marks are put back in place. So in a way, it's kind of like erasing memory in every generation. That doesn't necessarily totally close the door on epigenetics as in a kind of heredity in humans. There might be other molecules that can also carry this kind of epigenetic inheritance forward. And scientists are looking into these. And, and there are some studies on mice that are really intriguing, uh, really thought-provoking. And, and mice are closer to humans than plants are. They are. And so, the, exactly. And so there, there are these studies on mice. For example, you expose mice to an odor. And every time they smell this odor, they get a shock. And after a while, they learn that when they smell that odor, there's a shock coming. And you can see how they respond to just smelling it. They kind of, in effect, tense up the way you would if you kind of unconsciously knew something bad was about to happen. And these are all male mice, and when the researchers take their sperm and use it to fertilize mouse eggs, there are these studies that suggest that their offspring are also responding unusually to this particular smell. So it seems like these mice are inheriting memories, which is really uh, amazing to think about, but on the other hand, there are a lot of scientists who said, well, th this does not fit with all sorts of things that are very well established in biology. And so maybe the problem here is that these are very small studies and um, what they are claiming to be a real effect is just random noise. Carl Zimmer is a science writer. His most recent book is about the science of heredity. And if you will recall, we started this show saying we had two stories about genetic research, each from a unique laboratory with an airlock. Well, he'll return to tell you about the second one later in the show. The results of those mouse studies he described inspired research at the University of British Columbia in Canada into the long-term effects of stress on humans. The question... Could the consequences of that stress be passed on to the next generation? Scientists studied the sperm of men who had experienced sexual assault in childhood. 
and they discovered that a third of them carried a physical marker of that trauma. Now, the marker, or DNA tag, was found in the sperm cells of 12 of the 34 men studied. Now, what is a DNA tag? Well, it's just a molecule, one that contains CH3, that's one carbon and three hydrogen atoms, called a methyl group. And such molecules can attach onto the DNA's double helix. It's actually a common enough phenomenon, but the important thing is that these extra molecules can change the way a gene expresses itself, what kinds of proteins it produces, for example, how many, and like that. Think of genes in your DNA as little light bulbs says one of the study's researchers, Nicole Gladish. She's a Ph.D. candidate in the university's Department of Medical Genetics. DNA tags control to what degree those light bulbs are on or off. And the specific thing that we looked at in the study is called DNA methylation. So you can think of that as a dimmer switch of those light bulbs. So it's a tiny chemical tag on the DNA. And depending on how many of these little tags are within a gene, it acts as a dimmer and changes the amount of light emitted from that particular light bulb. Okay, so you were examining the sperm of men who had a history of childhood abuse to see whether that abuse uh, had some, you know, I don't know, effect on the sperm that would get passed on to their kids, right? Potentially. This study definitely doesn't address whether that happens, whether it gets passed on to their kids, but it does uh, answer that first step of, obviously, if we think that these tags and the signature of abuse can get passed on, then it would have to be present in the sperm. And that's why we decided to look at sperm in these men. Okay. Can you give me some idea of how abuse or stress as kids would have changed the epigenetic chemicals of these, of these men, of these adults? Yeah, sure. So when individuals experience chronic stress or trauma, they end up being predisposed to various diseases in adulthood, such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes. And these diseases all have this kind of pro-inflammatory aspect to them. So what we hypothesize is that these diseases later in life can pop up decades after the trauma because your body can't sustain chronic stress for long periods of time because it's not good for your body, obviously, to suppress all of these systems in order to give you that fight or flight response. So what we think is happening is that your body tries to reach a new normal, a new homeostasis, and that uh, all this extra cortisol and hormone being released has to be balanced by dysregulating the immune system, reproductive system, and other systems. And then this dysregulation over time can produce these diseases. And then that same mechanism would potentially lay down these marks on the DNA. Okay. Are are those what you call DNA tags? Yes, the DNA tags. Exactly. Maybe you can explain that to me in a way uh, a non-geneticist could understand. Because, uh, you know, I think of the DNA. There's this uh, double helix down in there. And it's got the code for everything that's going to become the kid. But uh, a DNA tag, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of my luggage. What, what, what is yeah. a DNA tag and how does that get passed on? Yeah, so the DNA tag is like a little methyl group, like a little addition that's added by proteins. So if you have your DNA is, is kind of is read by proteins, like little machines that kind of come and bind to the DNA and like essentially read that code. And those same proteins can actually then attach these tiny little molecular tags onto the DNA. It's kind of like a bookmark saying, like, this is an important gene to turn on and off in this situation. And then those tags are then, uh, when the cell replicates, there's proteins that make sure that those tags stay exactly where they should be in the next generation. Okay, so if I understand this correctly, Nicole, the history of abuse doesn't actually change the DNA in the sperm. I mean, that's Darwin, right? The DNA is the DNA. Exactly, yeah. But it might change the expression of that DNA. So it, it's kind of like this. The blueprints of a building would remain unchanged but the actual construction of that building would be different. Exactly, or another really useful analogy is looking at it like a recipe book, that the actual recipes you get printed in a book are always the same. But say you add a little extra spice one time versus another and you put like a little pencil mark inside and you mark it down that you can like then erase and like put back on and whatnot. That's kind of the idea of epigenetics, that it interacts with your environment. And we know that these marks or these tags change with environmental exposure, like, like smoking, heavy metal exposures, air pollution. So it's like your DNA's way of communicating with the environment in order to understand which genes to express so that you can survive best. All right, so tell me, what are you finding? Do the sperm show indications that they're passing on the epigenetics? 
Yeah, so we it was a small pilot study. These men were recruited from like a much larger cohort at Harvard University. My collaborator, Dr. Andrea Roberts, recruited them from a larger study of like almost 17,000 individuals. And we just wanted to see if it was feasible. So we took these 34 men. We didn't expect to see much difference because the sample size is so small. But what we found were differences in the men that were abused in 12 regions of DNA that were as great as 30% difference between the groups, which for our field is actually very high. Because typically we see differences of like one to to five percent. So, so you're saying that the epigenetic markers, these tags on the DNA, they're not stripped away during reproduction. I mean, they come along for the ride. Potentially. So we don't know for sure until we look. The vast majority of these tags are reshuffled and removed, and but there is some that that remain and stay on and are placed into you know one that sperm and egg meet after fertilization. So we don't know again until we get the next generation. But of course, because these marks interact so much with the environment and humans are very complex, it's I think it's going to be a long time. And how much of an effect this actually has? Those are all really big questions that still need to be answered. So we're still very far away from that. But it is really intriguing to investigate it. Nicole Gladish, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Nicole Gladish is a Ph.D. candidate in the Department of Medical Genetics at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. So it sounds like what we're hearing here is that men who were subject to abuse as children were subject to stress, and that stress raised the cortisol in their bodies, and their bodies had to compensate that with the regulation of other systems in their body. But the point is, is during that process, chemicals were produced that laid down DNA tags on some of their genes. The big question, and she said this was the question, is whether or not the tags in those sperm cells will make it into a newborn child. As a consequence, it's just not clear whether epigenetic changes are inherited by the next generation or not. But the research at the University of British Columbia is not a one-off study. It complements the findings of other studies that seem to suggest that modification of DNA due to environmental conditions were passed down, says genomicist Michael Snyder. He's the director of the Center for Genomics and Precision Medicine at Stanford University. Now, lots of activity and environmental conditions, not just stress, can modify DNA, for better or for worse, by the way. What you eat, the quality of air you breathe, and a big one, whether or not you regularly get that blood pumping. You may not realize it, but physical exercise will modify your DNA, which in turn is thought to affect your genes and how they're expressed. So uh, that is to say, exercise we know is healthy for you. That is to say, you will live longer if you exercise, things like that. Now, exactly how it works, we don't know. But we do know that if you exercise a lot, it will modify the DNA in your muscles and actually change the expression of genes in principle so you might get stronger and live longer. Well, I, I can understand how exercise might modify the condition of my muscles, their tone, whatever. But the DNA, I mean... Does that get passed on, or is that in DNA that will never make it to the next generation? It will not make it to the next generation in that particular case, as far as we know. Now, it turns out, though, that nutrition probably affects your DNA and can pass on in some ways that we don't fully understand. And as an example, when in the siege of St. Petersburg during World War II, lots of people starved. And actually, people came out short for generations after that. And there are other examples of this as well. That's thought to happen by DNA modification. And in fact, there's another interesting example I can tell you about, which is in Ghana, you can actually look at when kids are conceived, not when they're born, but when they're conceived, which is nine months before when they're born. And it turns out that kids conceived in the rainy season come out different in height and build than those in the dry season. Those in the dry season, the parents had better nutrition, the mom in particular, and so the kids come out a little bit healthier and a little bit bigger, and it's also the case they have differences in their modified DNA. So that is to say, nutrition actually does affect the modification of your DNA. Now, exactly how that makes you bigger and healthier, we don't understand. And that's thought to be able to pass into the next generations. I got to say, this is astounding because this, this, this sounds like, I don't know, Lamarckian evolution. This sounds like the stories, you know, that they believed 200 years ago that giraffes just stretched their necks a little bit. And so baby giraffes have longer necks. I mean, I thought that that was long gone, that idea. 
Well, I, I think most of the more permanent things like giraffes probably are genetically controlled. Uh, uh, how much is influenced by epigenetics isn't fully understood, but it is clear there are epigenetic effects. Most of them don't pass generational or so it's thought. We don't fully understand. It's a very active area of research. But it's pretty clear that epigenetics does affect you. I mean, uh, you and now, it actually turns out that, believe it or not, as you age, your DNA modifies as well. In fact, you can tell how old someone is from the modifications in their DNA. My goodness. All right. Well, <laughs> don't look at mine. That I mean, <laughs> by the way, that does not pass the next generation. So modifications in your DNA that are, are associated with your age, they will not pass into the next generation. That clock resets. So when you start out as a baby, you are a baby. I see. You don't get born as, a, as an old codger. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, all right. Now, we talk about controlling future generations by modifying DNA. I mean, this is encapsulated in the term designer babies. And I think a lot of people would go for that if it wasn't too expensive I don't know but this sounds like you could do things by you know just modify your diet and maybe your kids will have I don't know more musical talent I mean is that true does it go that far yeah that's not so clear I mean again it's a very poorly understood area and that's why a lot of people are working on it it's very very clear that the nutritional and other health of a pregnant mom has a huge influence on the unborn fetus so Actually, pregnant women need to take care of themselves, obviously, and you know, hear how they shouldn't smoke and drink alcohol. Those are very, very real effects. Now, to what extent they wind up modifying the DNA of the fetus is not so clear, but it is very likely that is the case. So I would argue that that's a huge and very important developmental time. And in fact, there's an area called preterm birth. Babies who are born too early can have significant health problems. And and that often happens because of issues associated with environment. So pregnant women who live in poor areas have a much higher incidence of preterm birth and it's thought because they're not necessarily giving good nutrition and such to their kids. The child will not develop properly and, and maybe get born early. And that does have serious health consequences. And so it's plausible. We don't know for sure, but it seems very likely that some of that will be epigenetic then. Those kids that are born earlier could have modified DNA that's a little bit different than those of others. So environment does have a big effect. Michael Snyder, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thanks for having me here. Michael Snyder is the chair of the Genetics Department and the director of the Center for Genomics and Precision Medicine at Stanford University. The epigenetics effect is one reason that our ideas of heredity are changing, but there's another, a powerful genetic tool called CRISPR. A second experiment in which an airlock is involved next. It's DNA is not destiny on Big Picture Science. promised you two stories about genetic research taking place behind airlocked doors. One was on the International Space Station, the other, in Southern California, was visited by reporter Carl Zimmer. So one day I went to visit a biologist named Anthony James. He works at the University of California at Irvine. And we went down to the basement and put on surgical gowns. Then he opens up this door into this small room. He closes the door behind him, and we're actually basically in an airlock. He turns to an inner door, and he opens that one up, and we go into his lab, which is an insectarium. It's a place where he raises thousands of mosquitoes. The lab is abuzz with research because while a mosquito may look non-threatening, I mean, it's small enough to perch on a fingernail, no insect species has been a more efficient killer. For one, they carry malaria, a disease that deals death to hundreds of thousands of people a year, mostly children. The gamble at the University of California, Irvine, insert a gene into a mosquito that will stop its deadly parasite passenger and then release those genetically modified insects into the wild. 
The gene editing technique CRISPR allows for these precise and rapid edits, which, when combined with gene drives, greatly increases the chances that the genetic modifications are inherited again and again. Carl Zimmer's visit to Anthony James Insectarium was part of the research for his latest book, She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. It explores, among other things, how having the power to change genes directly challenges our traditional notions of heredity. Carl, can you describe what it was like to be inside this insectarium? Were the mosquitoes buzzing all around you? How close did you get to them? So, you know, this is not a place where you're just like in one gigantic cloud of mosquitoes. Uh, it, It would be very hard to do research and to breed these mosquitoes if they were just going around willy nilly. They're managed at each stage of their life cycle. So when they're when they're larvae, um, swimming around in water, which is what mosquitoes do, and so they're in these little Tupperware tubs that are sealed, and they're off in their own room. And once they have developed into um, adults with wings, then they're put in jars where the males and females mate. And then the females then need to drink blood. And so they get transferred to, of all things, these movie popcorn tubs where James and his colleagues stick this little container of warm blood on top of the lid. And then the mosquitoes are underneath sort of sticking their little uh, mouth parts through a membrane to to drink the blood. So they're all sort of hanging upside down, feeding on blood. It's quite bizarre. It's good luck for the mosquitoes because they get free refills on those tubs. That's right. That's right. As much blood as you can handle. And then and then once they're ready to lay eggs, then they are transferred into a dark room because female mosquitoes like to be in the dark when they lay their eggs. And they're put in other jars. And then um, they lay their eggs there. And then they die. And the scientists extract these little strips of eggs, which they then take to insert DNA into. It does have a little creepy factor. You Maybe know, it's the cow's blood. Well, the yeah. bucket of cow's blood. Oh, yeah. No, there's, there, there's definitely a creepiness to it. But then at the same time, you think, well, you know, what if, what if I'm looking at the cure for malaria? I mean, that would be an amazing thing. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people die every year of malaria. So, you know, I think a little creepiness with some mosquitoes drinking blood is, it's worth it. I wonder if you could describe how he is using CRISPR to genetically modify these mosquitoes in order to eradicate malaria. So what James wants to do is to produce a population of mosquitoes that cannot carry malaria. And so malaria is caused by a parasite. Uh, A person sick with malaria has the parasite in their blood. Mosquito bites them, takes in the parasite, and then goes off and bites somebody else, spreads the disease. So what if... Uh, a mosquito, as soon as it took in the malaria parasite, killed the parasite with its own antibodies. Then you would break the chain and malaria would disappear. So James has been working for years and years and years trying to figure out the basics of how that might work. And he found part of the solution, which is that he discovered that there's a particular kind of antibody that can wipe out malaria parasites inside mosquitoes. And so he can actually insert that gene for that antibody into the mosquitoes. Now, the problem is that you could engineer some mosquitoes with that gene, and then you'd set them loose in the wild. And they're surrounded by millions of ordinary mosquitoes that don't have that particular uh, engineered gene. And within a couple generations, that engineered gene might just sort of disappear from the gene pool, which is be gone and because all the mosquitoes are mating like crazy and shuffling their genes, and that's it. So it wouldn't, wouldn't really do much good. But what CRISPR does is, is give you this way to actually drive that gene into more and more mosquitoes over the generations. So what James and his colleagues are doing is they're actually putting the genes for CRISPR into the mosquitoes along with this antibody gene. And so it's a package that they put in the mosquito. So it has the toolkit along with it. Right. So so inside a mosquito larva, you might have one copy of a chromosome that has the antibody gene and the CRISPR gene, and the other chromosome is just ordinary. Inside of that mosquito, the CRISPR molecules get produced and they rewrite the DNA on the other chromosome. So now you have two copies of 
that antibody gene, whereas the mosquito started out with just one. And then it's going to pass on the CRISPR antibody package to its descendants. So it's a process that's sometimes called gene drive because it just drives this gene further and further into the population. And there are mathematical models that suggest that it would take just a matter of a few years to basically have the entire population carry this malaria-proof gene. How far has he gotten in the lab in doing this? Well, they're they're producing these mosquitoes generation after generation that are resistant to malaria. And there are other groups that are doing this as well. And so, you know, there's no reason to think that you won't have a mosquito stock ready to go to be released into a malaria intense place like Africa or India, you know, within the decade, if we so choose. And it seems like a win-win because people in general are not fans of mosquitoes and malaria is a deadly disease. So why not wipe out the disease? And if you wipe out some mosquitoes too, if that happens. But could there be unforeseen consequences? Of course, because they're unforeseen. But, you know, we're talking about eliminating a disease, maybe even eliminating the mosquito itself, if that were to happen. Could there be a downside to that? Yeah, there could be. So one kind of application of gene drive that people have talked about is, sounds kind of paradoxical, but it is to drive a gene for infertility into a population. Uh, Of mosquitoes. uh, Of mosquitoes or maybe some invasive species of mouse that you don't like, you want to get rid of. Um, so basically what would happen is that, you know, mosquitoes or mice that inherited this gene would have m- much fewer offspring. And, uh, and the more that the gene would spread, the smaller the population would get until it would just crash. Uh, what if with mosquitoes that are malaria proof, does that somehow give them some, I don't know, some reproductive edge or some disadvantage that we don't even know about? Are you going to disrupt mosquito ecology? And people might say, like, ah, oh, mosquitoes, who cares about them? Well, you know, there are lots of species that eat mosquitoes and lots of other species that eat the species that eat mosquitoes. And what happens if you start to tinker with that? How, how do you pull CRISPR back out of the wild once you've set it loose? Um, so some scientists have said, you know, maybe we shouldn't even be talking about using this for conservation at all. Have any of these mosquitoes escaped Anthony James' lab? Is there any way of telling whether or not one of these altered mosquitoes has escaped his lab? Well, it's not like the mosquitoes all have like little trackers on them, but um, there are just many, many uh, uh, safeguards in place to keep mosquitoes getting out. It's not just an airlock. Um, it's all sorts of safeguards that are there, that, you know, ways of killing off mosquitoes that, that get out. And also, I think one of the most fundamental safeguards is that these mosquitoes that he studies are not native to uh, Southern California. And in fact, they're native to it in a totally different environment in India, a very lush, moist environment. Irvine is not moist. It's a, you know, it's a sunny, dry place. And so it's Basically, like if those mosquitoes get out, they're just going to just drop dead in the parking lot, probably. So, yeah, there are lots of uh, there are lots of safeguards in place, but there are going to be you know uh, issues about uh, safety that will extend to other experiments in the future because you know if they can really you know establish uh, mosquitoes that and really prove that they that CRISPR makes them resistant to malaria that and that it passes down sustainably through the generations. It really works as they hope it works. They're going to have to do a test out of, outside of the lab. They're going to have to find some place where they're going to um, do a limited release and see how well it works. And that is a big deal because, you know, it's, it's kind of open-ended. I mean, once you really do just, you know, set a mosquito out in an environment where it can thrive, um, you know, they're mosquitoes. I mean, they're going to just take off. And, you know, and there are people there. So scientists and doctors are, are working with communities in India, in Africa, um, and elsewhere to sort of talk about what they want to do and the, the you know, the, the possible risks, the possible benefits, and so on. And, you know, the, the, these communities are going to have to be totally buying into these experiments. Otherwise, I think that the whole idea of using gene drive to fight malaria will just grind to a halt. Well, finally, 
Do you think that that's a right characterization um, or an accurate one to say that what we're looking for now is a way to control our destiny or control heredity, to control evolution in some ways? Well, I, I think it depends on who you ask. I mean, I think some people feel that we should uh, exert no control at all over any of that. And then some people say that, well, as human beings, that's exactly what we should be doing. Um, and you can people have done surveys on these issues, and, and you get very divided results. Carl Zimmer, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Carl Zimmer is a science writer, a columnist for The New York Times, and the author of She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. Thanks to the unique combination of genes that help make up those who help produce the show. Senior producer Gary Niederhoff, production assistant Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. We're also grateful for financial support from Rina Shulsky-David and Sammy David and the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science that is called DNA is Not Destiny. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, well, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And you can also find links there to our guests. Oh, and if you never want to miss an episode, subscribe to BiPiSci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or iHeartRadio.